I would like to start my talk. Can you all hear me? Is that all right? I would like to start my talk with two vignettes from the German mass media. The first one is from the newspaper Die Welt and appeared about six months after the first uh, Pisa shock on the 23rd of May 2002, uh, when politicians, uh, when German educational politicians were traveling northward en masse uh, to Finland. And in this article, the um, Die Welt uh, celebrates uh, the Finnish all-day school, die Ganztagsschule, uh, as the secret behind Finland's uh, PISA success. It also puts this causal connection into the mouth of the then federal education minister, Edelgard Buhlmann. So the message of the article is Germany could also be better if it had an all-day school. Um, all-day schooling was a hot reform topic at this time in Germany, and um, referring to Finland was supposed to create legitimacy for policy reform in that direction. Now, what most readers of this article probably did not know was that at the time the article was written, Finland didn't have an all-day school. Finnish pupils were at home uh, around lunchtime, just like their um, <laughs> German um, counterparts, with, with the difference that they, they got lunch in school in Finland, but they were home at the same time, more or less. So, um, yeah. The second vignette is uh, this one. That's from the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, <laughs> reporting on and, you know, um, January 2011, and. We all know that PISA results tend to be uh, reported in December of the, follow the year after the study. So you can see this is about a month after the results of PISA 2009 were um, reported. And we all know that that was the year when, when Shanghai uh, led in all three uh, domains. Um, and in this article, the everyday life of a student in Shanghai is presented. He has no time to play. He's coached like a professional athlete by his parents. <laughs> and exams play an important role in his life. One quote from the article, a Chinese childhood consists of running the gauntlet from one exam to the next. And the caption of this picture, where you see these young uh, students doing very strenuous things, is you have to start early if you want to succeed in the battle of competition. And what's even more interesting than the caption of the picture is the subheadline down here. Um, Shanghai has the best pupils in the world. European and American experts ask what we have done wrong. The answer is, Nothing. So again, what happens in Shanghai, or what supposedly happens in Shanghai, is connected to the discussion in Germany. And arguably, it's supposed to delegitimate um, certain policy agendas that might come into fashion following uh, Shanghai's PISA success. And it's like supposed to, in a sense, you can say, shrug off the challenge posed by Shanghai's PISA success. So both articles present stories about what they picture as education in other countries and they draw conclusions for the German case, although very different ones. Um, yeah, the shared trait between the uh, two articles is um, that what they present has much more to do with Germany than with Finland or China. So far, so good. I'm not telling you anything new. You all knew, know that that's received wisdom in um, policy, uh, in, in borrowing research, for borrowing to occur. Things do not have to be good, they have to fit. That's sort of one of the things that have been shown again and again. Now, my argument today goes one step further than this. Um, I would say that when it comes to references to other countries, not only does the selection of what is referred to depend on the country that is looking out, as it were, not the one that is referred to, but what is referred to doesn't even have to exist in that country. So not, you could say a bit more informally, not, it doesn't have to be good, we knew that, but it doesn't even have to be true. So foreign countries act as projection screens for conceptions of the good school and for um, project as projection screens for conceptions of the bad school. So what I want to do today is say a bit about how this uh, phenomenon works and more particularly address three questions. The first is which countries are uh, used as projection screens. The second one is what are the functions of these projection screens in um, educational policy making and finally as this is the, the overarching topic of the, um, of the whole symposium, uh, I would like to add some thoughts on what this means for um, the qu question of con uh, convergence slash non-convergence. Before I address these questions, I have to say some words on the notion of reference societies. Um, um, th this is usually used, you all know the term reference society, it's so used near uh, ubiquitously and it's 
always or nearly always used in the, in the sense of positive model. Um, what was coined by Reinhard Bendix, German-American macrosociologist, and, and he too uses it in the sense of positive model, but it's interesting to look at the original definition. I'm going to read it to you. I shall use the term reference society whenever intellectual leaders and an educated public react to the values and institutions of another country with ideas and actions that pertain to their own country. So if you look at this closely, this is neutral uh, in, in relation to whether it's a positive model or a negative um, model. And I think that we can, like, we can gain a more thorough understanding of uh, how reference societies work if we look at negative reference societies in conjunction with positive reference societies. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to try and uh, do that today. The empirical basis for what I'm going to talk about, I, was, I, I chucked that bit out. I'm very glad to talk about that in the, in the discussion um, because it would have taken, I thought it would have taken too much um, time, but I, uh, let it suffice now um, to say that what I'm going to say builds on um, content analysis of media, especially frame analysis, and mass media are particularly interesting for this kind of study uh, because um, they do not just report social, uh, social reality, but in a sense produce it. Anything that happens outside our immediate vicinity, we know through uh, the mass media, the, the, the way, the, the world we know, we know through the um, mass media. And in this production of the social world, media use frames, which you can see as patterns of perception and interpretation that reduce complexity and that have to resonate with the, with the audience's frames. Um, and like the media use these frames, and on the one hand, like they have to resonate with their audiences, at the other hand, of course, in this usage, they also perpetuate uh, these, these um, frames. Um, so, yeah, just, if you're more interested in the empirical basis and like its systematic aspects, I'm very happy to return to that in the discussion. So, first question, finally, um, which countries are used as projection screens? There is a substantial literature on which or on why countries become reference societies. The traditional explanations are also the one used by Bendix, uh, like that's often military and economic uh, competitors, um, like Japan, the Meiji era, and so on. There are many, uh, many instances of people who have like, looked at this uh, particular case. And then there are some people like, for example, Bob Lingard has, has worked on that and have argued that um, large-scale assessments have reconfigured the way in which reference societies are uh, constructed. The existence of international comparative data has reconfigured how um, reference societies are constructed. Um, but there's no automatism uh, here. That's also a thing I'm going to uh, argue here. Good scores and large-scale assessments do not automatically make a country a reference society. And definitely not automatically a positive one, as we're going to see. I'm going to focus in the following on two sets of reference societies that are important in the German education policy making debate. There are others, for example, in higher education, the US would be one of these, but like if you look at uh, K-12 education, um, these are the ones that I would argue are the most important. The first set is um, the countries of the North or Scandinavia. Uh, which often I, I use this li like they're often often subsumed under this this uh, unifying um, label to the horror of uh, many of the people living in these countries. Um, the traits that are uh, commonly and stereotypically associated with this country are, with with these countries are that they have progressive child-centered education. Pupils learn because they're intrinsically motivated. Education is like organized in a way that it contributes to social justice and. There are like, sh different opinions on comprehensive schooling. I will um, return to that. That's why it's in brackets. The other set of uh, reference societies I'm going to talk about is this one, um, Asia. I've also uh, put it, or I've, I've put it in um, quotation marks because I'm well aware that <laughs> this is not, um, yeah, like, like this, this is not uh, Asia, but, but often you can, you can find that subsumed in the media as the Asiatician. Bildungssysteme, these are like the PISA participants that were um, particularly, um, yeah, who, about whose uh, results we've talked a lot of the, um, yesterday and also already at the last um, symposium. The traits that are associated with Asia are often that they're 
education systems are characterized by rote learning, drill, there are tough exams, um, leading to the prevalence of shadow education, cram schools such as the Japanese juku. Um, there are parents are extremely ambitious and push pu pupils hard, and that leads to lots of pupil suicides. Um, that's like the, the stereotypical um, picture here. Now, two interesting things strike you when you're looking at these sets of reference societies uh, in conjunction. The first is that um, even negative reference societies are top scorers. So bad PISA results do not lead to becoming a, a negative reference society. They lead to non-reference. This is a map of all the countries participating in PISA 2012. You see the world is red. It's like a bit, I was reminded by these maps of, that were made at the heyday of the British Empire where the world was red for a different reason. But the world is red because all these countries are uh, participating, but countries like Albania, Qatar, Peru, Kyr Kyrgyzstan, all PISA uh, participants, some of them, several rounds, do not exist for educational policy making uh, in Germany, despite the fact that they all participated in PISA, just as China was virtually non existent in the educational policy making discourse before uh, Shanghai scored so um, highly. Now, if we ask ourselves why this is so, it's straightforward enough why some top scorers turn into positive reference societies, right? Good results seen as an indication of good education. That's why we want to do what they want to do. Um, now, it's more, more difficult to explain why some top scorers turn into negative reference societies. And if you were a social psychologist, which I'm not, uh, you might want to explain this by a version of cognitive dissonance theory in the sense that like, the theory stipulates People strive for internal consistency, and if they experience contradictory con cognitions that don't fit together, um, they're, going to, they're going to, in order to relieve the stress that that creates, they're going to modify the cognitions. And in this case, you have a, a state of tension coming from the fact that these East Asian countries score very highly in PISA, which is taken as an indication that they're good, in, in like that they have a good education in a certain way. At the same time, there is, and this is already coming like to, to the, or I'm slowly leading to the second point why um, this is so striking. At the same time, there's a very negative framing of these, these countries' education, which makes it very difficult to construct them as positive reference societies. So again, saying it in colloquial terms, they seem to be doing well, but we do not follow their example. So that has to be, this tension has to be relieved somehow. And one way of doing that is finding reasons why uh, it, this is bought at too high a price, and that's exactly what happens in the uh, educational policy making discussion in Germany. Remember the, the vignette in the beginning of the, with the, you know, the little boys hanging from that climbing bar? Um, if you have to assert that you're not doing anything wrong by not borrowing from them, that may be an indication that, um, yeah, that there is a certain challenge here that you have to actively shrug off. You remember the, the sentence, experts are asking themselves what they're doing wrong, the answer is nothing. That is sort of, um, points to the fact that there, um, in Germany you'd say Pfeifen im Walde, that you're kind of whistling in the forest in order to dispel or to, to dis demonstrate that you're not afraid, although you are really afraid. <laughs> and of course countries that do not, and that's most of them, um, here countries that do not score that highly do not create cognitive dissonance in that way, because the fact that Albania does things different in education than Germany does like not create, create a challenge in the same way as uh, the fact that South Korea does. Um, so both positive and negative reference societies of high scores. Now the second point is, which I was sort of leading to, is um, so, so which high scorers become positive, which ones become negative reference societies? And um, I would argue that that depends very much on frames connected to prior stereotyped perceptions of these countries. I've just submitted a paper on that to um, uh, to the Zeitschrift der Pädagogik, so the bad news is the paper is in German, but, um, and also it, it's, it's not, I haven't got the, the reviews yet, so um, uh, you, you may not be missing anything anyway, but it's, um, <laughs> but um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that uh, now. And one concept borrowed from marketing research might help here to understand how this works, and that's the concept of the country of origin effect. Um, it means that the perceived origin of a product plays a role for customers' decisions to buy or not buy a certain product. And, and it's important here that important is the presumed origin, not the actual origin. One example you all know is the ice cream brand Hagen Das, 
which is supposed to sound Danish. In earlier uh, times, the, the logo of Hagen Dust also featured, uh, featured an outline of, of Denmark. Um, the thing is, Hagen Dust is not Danish at all. Hagen Dust is uh, produced by a company called Pillsbury that is, um, has its headquarters in Minneapolis. But um, apparently, um, apparently the, the people in the marketing department thought that like, let, let, let's have another bowl of Pillsbury didn't sound as good as like, <laughs> have, have some more Hagen Dust. So that's a, that's a good example for, for that. And, and you find that all of the time, these country of origin um, effects. I was sort of just, as an aside, uh, the, the jacket I was wearing earlier uh, has got an, an Italian brand name, and I, I initially hesitated buying it because I thought, oh, will, will an Italian jacket be able to withstand the New York or Berlin winters? Until, well, and then after I'd bought it, I found out that it was actually designed in Mönchengladbach, which is a <laughs> particularly drab um, town in um, Western Germany. Um, <laughs> right, and I would, so information about the perceived origin, as it were, constitutes a shortcut to information about the, in, in the minds of those, uh, um, well, who are affected by the effect, to information about the project, or substitutes for information about the product. Um, and I would argue that this works similarly with educational reform. Knowledge about the presumed origin of educational reform agendas substitutes for knowledge about the agendas themselves. Um, and in this way, knowledge about the presumed origin creates legitimacy for certain reform agendas. So if something is supposed to be, f or, yeah, it's supposed to be finished, it is good. Remember the, the vignette in the beginning. Never mind if it's actually uh, finished or not. Conversely, if it is Asian, it is bad. Now, and why country of origin effects work has to do with the fact that they're connected to national stereotypes. A stereotype is a generalization concerning a certain group, a national stereotype, generalization concerning a, well, certain nation, people from a certain nation. Um, stereotypes are a completely normal element of how we process knowledge about groups. We all stereotype all of the time. <coughs> and national stereotypes can also be part, that's another thing worth saying here, of like larger groups of stereotypes, transnational stereotypes, they're, they're called, and both, uh, both Finland and the East Asian countries um, are like part of, of one of these larger transnational um, stereotypes. You can see that in, in Scandinavia, for a long time uh, you could read about the Scandinavian educational systems uh, being the leading the pack of, of PISA countries and so on. If you look at the actual results, there's a huge difference between Finland and Norway, say, or, or it's abs there's no justification if you look at the data to, to subsume them under, under this label, but still that's, that's what um, happened. You can, especially Sweden and Finland are often, often named in one breath, um, and that, that has kind of declined now with, with Sweden becoming like the, the, the well, or sort of the story of Sweden and Pisa becoming the story of one country like really uh, going down now. This Sweden has disappeared out of the, the Sweden und Finland formula, um, but still Finland can build on a on an earlier positive stereotype of the North. Conversely, the same is uh, true with Asia. Already long before Pisa, there there are very. I, I, I went back into the 1990s and looked at, at media reports. Then there are very very few reports on education in Asia, but the ones there are already unanimously negative. Then and this is not shaken by the positive um, PISA results. So, yeah, maybe I should have said something about the empirical body on which this is based, but in my whole sample, I did not, which, which, uh, which uh, comprises of articles, or a systematic collection of all the articles published in um, the two main quality newspapers in Germany from 2001 to 2011. Um, there's not a single unanimously positive article about education in Asia. I mean, sometimes they kind of pick out certain different um, certain traits, but there's not, not one article that kind of celebrates, I don't know, South Korea or, or whatever, in stark contrast to, to um, Finland. Um, two, more, two more observations uh, concerning stereotypes. Stereotypes are not the message itself, but the context in which the message is processed. So stereotypical views color how these reports, um, or how, how things like PISA scores are received and processed in educational policy making. So a good result in PISA in, in the Finnish case um, is presented as a result of an activating culture of learning and intrinsic motivation. A good, one good result in the Asian ca case is a result of drill and um, like pushing pupils too hard. 
Okay, I'll now turn to the second of my questions. Um, which functions do, do um, these um, dust projection um, fulfill in educational policy making? In order to do that, we first need to take a, take a closer look at the function of reference societies, both negative and uh, positive. And it's also, I think, quite interesting that in the age of global benchmarks and the like, we still seem to need reference societies in the shape of actual nation states. So the first function I would like to talk about is um, that reference societies create plausibility for policy scenarios. Right? They, they make positive and negative educational policy scenarios plausible and serve to legitimate or delegitimate them. They make the place where you want to go and where you do not want to go uh, more real, as it were. And the um, political scientist Michael Mintrum, working from a policy entrepreneurship framework, said that um, the appropriation of a certain policy is aided if the policy entrepreneur is able to say, I've seen the future and it works. Um, that makes it easier to adopt certain um, policies. And John Mayer, writing in 1986, that is at the time when US interest in Japan was particularly high, has written about uh, why people um, in the US are interested in Japan. I quote John Mayer, people have shown less interest in real research on Japanese education than in depicting Japanese education as a mythological device to portray a desirable future. And I think that's putting it uh, very nicely, what, what's happening there. You can already see here, by the way, that perception of East Asia is quite different in the US from the case I'm uh, presenting. I will return to that. And in order to, well, to like illustrate that by um, empirically, I've got another article for, here, for you here. This is an article from the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, entitled Das Paradies im Norden. Even if you don't speak German, you'll be able to, to read this. Paradise in the North, um, why Finland schools are leading the world and what Bavaria, that's one federal state in Germany, can learn from them. And the article contrasts Bavarian schools with Finnish schools. And the kicker of the article sums up the story. Um, mehr Lehrer, kein Notendruck, kein Sitzen bleiben. More teachers, no pressure to perform, no repetition of grades. And I think the picture, the, the photo montage, is also quite, quite uh, nice. It shows that Bavaria is trapped in time 50 years back in black and white, um, whereas Finland is, is modern. Even the pupils are taller in Finland. <laughs> so it's... Um, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Yeah, these are these, are these, these leather... Um, yeah, yeah, Lederhosen. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, yeah. That is, I sort of, I, I didn't even think about that because I instantly recognized what was supposed to be, uh, what was supposed to be. What. So Bavaria is trapped in time and it's black and white, whereas Finland has arrived in um, modern times. The mirror image to this, um, of course, is, pre is uh, provided by the article I showed you as a vignette in the beginning. You know, with the little boys. Um, so negative reference societies uh, show. Not I've seen the future and it works, but I've seen the future and it is horrible, or I've seen the future and it has horrible unintended consequences, or something like, like that. But it also makes uh, a, an alternative future, a possible future, more uh, palpable, more visible. Here are some more examples from uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung and Frankfurter Allgemeine. This, this time about uh, South Korea, Jugend ohne Schlaf, Youth without sleep. Uh, für das Lernen ist kein Preis zu hoch. For learning, no price is too high. And you can see that this <laughs> little girl has uh, fallen asleep under the strain. Um, so, yeah, in this case, um, these you, you could argue that these articles are supposed to delegitimate reforms, to diffuse a certain reform um, pressure. And both positive and desirable and negative and undesirable um, uh, potential futures for one's country become more real by associating them with certain countries. How faithful these imagined futures are to what actually is happening in these countries is a question of minor importance in this connection. Okay, the second function, well, in the interest of, of time, I'm going to keep that very, very short, would be like creating a sense of unity. That's especially true in the case of negative reference societies. When there's no agreement where you want to go, Maybe at least you can create agreement about where not to go. But I'll, as I said, I will largely hop over this function. Coming right away to the third function, um, which is projection in yet a different sense. So w when talking about projection, I've been sort of so. F when I first started talking about projection, I thought of slide projectors. Like just 
by this mere fact, I probably show that I'm uh, older than 40 because um, I still know what a slide projector is. But it's, um, but as you all know, projection also is a is a term used by psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalysis, and possibly the psychoanalytical connotations of the term are not totally amiss here either. I mean, I'm, I'm well aware that it's dangerous to apply uh, psychoanalytic terms uh, to um, policy making. But still, psycho like in psychoanalysis, projection is one of the defensive mechanisms of the self. Certain traits one does not like about oneself, one ascribes uh, to others, thereby externalizes them. Now, this time not in, in Luhmann's sense, externalizes them, but like gets, gets rid of them by, by uh, projecting them onto some, someone else. Um, now, it's striking that the aspects that are criticized about education in Asia uh, are those that meet with criticism in Germany about the German system as well. Two examples for this. One is, um, you remember, yeah, youth without sleep. Uh, the debate on overburdening that goes back to the 19th century. The idea that especially academic track schooling overtaxes the mental and bodily strength of pupils, leaving them damaged. The newest incarnation of this debate in Germany is the debate uh, on the eighth year gymnasium. They've reduced the, the number of years in the academic track secondary schools, and that has led to a huge debate whether that, um, yeah deprives uh, pupils of their sleep and produces a generation stress and so on. And some of these arguments in this debate um, are quite similar to the ones named in relation to education in Asia. We see youth without sleep. The second one is unhappiness about the sel selection um, um, or allocation of life chances function of the educational system. Many teachers, and this is not a new result either, has been shown many, many times that a lot of teachers feel very unhappy with their function of allocating life chances, opening, closing um, doors for um, pupils. And possibly an echo of this unpleasant feeling uh, can be found in the criticism of uh, exam hell in Asian schools, where the sole purpose of learning is supposed to be succeeding in, uh, in university entrance exams and similar. So possibly in the German damnation of Asian cram school and exam hell, we are externalizing our bad feelings about aspects of our own system. Just like, I'm asking this hypothetically, knowing that it's um, quite difficult to show that kind of thing, actually. One last point about uh, the, the second question, about the, the which functions question, before I move on to the third question. And that's just the observation that negative and positive reference societies do not just like exist next to each other, but they can actually stabilize and reinforce each other. There's a kind of heaven and hell logics here. Heaven becomes more attractive and hell becomes more scary if there is an alternative. And you can even see that in the rhetoric that is used. Like Scandinavian Finland, as you've seen, appear as, uh, as a paradise in the north to which people undertake Pisa pilgrimages. This is actually a quote. I didn't make this up. Um, and the Asian, the Asian, Asian system is the mirror image. You get examination hell with the youth without sleep, where children have to run the gauntlet from examination to examination. So you can see that on the side of Finland, you have metaphors of redemption, um, you know, paradise, pilgrimage. On the side of, of Asia, you've got hell, torture, like not letting pe deep sleep deprivation, running the gauntlet. These, these are potentially lethal methods of torture, of course. Um, and there are even some articles that make this duality explicit. We've got this one from Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, I'm going to read the quote. Two different pedagogical traditions turn out to be successful in the international PISA tests. On the one hand, school cultures such as in China and South Korea that are founded on performance and diligence merging into drill. I'm not sure diligence is the right translation, but never mind. Um, and on the other hand, more liberal, progressively inspired school systems, as in Finland. So possibly I've, the, I've seen the future and it works argument is more effective if there also is a very unattractive future to compare the desirable one with. So I'll leave the functions for the time being and move on to convergence. Now, when we talk about convergence, I think we first have to ask convergence concerning what um, and in relation to what. And I propose here to distinguish between like, convergence and policy responses. Of course, you could, um, Tony was talking about that yesterday, you could distinguish further within these different types. I'm not going to talk about um, policy responses here because my paper isn't really about uh, what actually, which, which agendas are then actually um, appropriated. And so I'm going to talk more about the second and the third 
type of convergence I distinguish here. The second one is convergence in mode of, modes of reference, what uh, Jürgen Schrieber would call forms of externalization. Um, I think in, in that there's definitely convergence in the sense of, on the one end of joining um, LSAs, more and more countries are participating, and um, uh, but, but that's not all. There's also convergence in referring to uh, large-scale assessments. Even countries that at first did not seem to be that interested are increasingly referring. I mean, Nancy Green has talked about that yesterday. Um, Bob and Sam have also uh, shown shown that in several papers. Um, so the mode of reference to large-scale assessments as a legitimatory device seems to, to be on the rise. And um, in many cases, we can see here a combination of externalization to, um, to um, world situations with a, an externalization to scientificalness. Um, and this seems to, like in combination to be a particularly um, effective leg legitimatory um, device. Um, also, like just um, as an aside here, it's uh, well that, that more refers more to the, to the first um, bit, like more and more countries joining. But Camilla's doctoral dissertation has also uh, shown very nicely uh, how uh, countries join large-scale assessments not because they're interested in the results, but like in, in the terms of world culture theory, because it has become part of the, the package of what it means to be a legitimate nation state to, um, to participate um, in them. But I mean, we still have to, to remember that like then on the ground very different things are being legitimated by the actual references. Um, now the third point is uh, what's probably most pertinent to what I've been talking about, convergence in the use of certain countries as reference societies, maybe even the emergence of global reference societies. Um, there definitely seem to be certain countries on which attention centers that are clearly linked to large-scale assessments. Finland would never have become this attractive for so large parts of the world if it hadn't been uh, for PISA. Um, at the same time, um, the projection is quite dependent on where the projector stands and which slide um, is enters, entered. And that I want to like talk a bit about that before I um, finish. And the first example I want to give you is um, what is being projected from two different countries onto the projection screen of Finland. And um, yeah, I'll hurry up a bit. So, but another five minutes, okay? Okay, fine. So. Um, on the one hand, we have the German projection onto Finland. I was talking about that progressive, child-centered, pupils learn because they're intrinsically motivated, and so on and so on. Now, if you look at what the Swedes project onto, uh, onto Finland, you get a completely different country. In, in, in Sweden, Finland is, Finnish education is often portrayed as, as a place where like, there's law and order, where the pupils are still doing what the, what the, um, what the teacher says, and some, some, people, some people like that, some sort of more conservative educational politicians say, well, that's great, we should also have that. Some say, oh, that's horrible, we don't, we don't want that, but they, sort of the, the, the general picture that is painted as this kind of law and order place is, is quite, um, sort of is, is shared by, both by those who like the picture and those who don't like the picture. Um, so again, you see very clearly that what, what you see on the screen has much more to do with Sweden and Germany than w with Finland. The same is true for Asia, um, this is just a clip from, from the Times. Chinese math teachers bring can-do culture to UK schools, and down here, math teachers told to copy the Chinese. Um, almost as in Meiji, Japan, experts are being flown in to show that it's supposed to show UK math teachers how to do it. Um, this is, goes back to an initiative started by Junior Minister Elizabeth Trust, Truss, who went to a fact-finding mission, I love the world, to, to Shanghai to find out what they are doing differently, but the thi I would argue that the, the, the facts that she found there is, is much less facts about Shanghai, but facts about what prior perceptions she had of what she was going to find. So, but what you can definitely see is that in the UK you have a, um, quite a different, uh, quite a different um, framing of education in Asia, and also in the US, the same would be true. Others such as uh, Gerald Latendre, Bill Cummings, or John Tobin have studied the way Japanese education was viewed in the US over the years and have detected a progression from wow, the 1970s, to uh-oh, the 1980s, to a yes, but view, which I find a particularly nice way of putting it in the 1990s. So they found changes over time, but not unanimously negative frames as in the German ca case over such a long um, time. 
So there are different views from different places, and like in, in this, I would sort of slightly or slightly nuance Bob's and Sam's argument about about Asia. The, or sort of not saying that, that that's not true for the for the countries you've looked at, but that doesn't. I, I don't think that the shift from Finland to Asia you you detect in the countries you've looked at is really that. It, it's it's not happening every everywhere in that way. Um, but still, I mean, it's an open question what's going to happen in, in the coming years. I mean, the, the, the prevalence of this, this type of international comparative data is still a comparatively new phenom phenomenon. So um, one doesn't know how long this is. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens in Germany if, if these Asian countries continue to, to score that highly um, year or round after round after round. Just a final um, Another three minutes? Is that okay? Is it bargaining? <laughs> is this a bargaining? No, well, but this, so this is just, just two, two pages. Okay. Well, the, the final point here before I, before I come to my, to my very short conclusion is um, that, uh, of course, one has to also beware uh, to, to reify, reify countries unduly. If you look at how references to countries and to individual aspects within countries are built into policy argumentations. You can see that even within one and the same country, there are, they can be quite, uh, they can be built in, in quite different ways. Not going to go into this in, in detail, but reference to individual support of pupils in Finland is a good case in point. If you contrast what the German left-wing teachers union, GEV, says about that and what the German, um, the, the Bavarian educational minister, Siegfried Schneider, says about that. And the GEV is, is in favor of comprehensivizing the German system. So they say, Finnish individual support, great, that's what we need, because that's what's going to guarantee that comprehensive schooling works. Siegfried Schneider says, individualizing of individualized support of pupils, great, we need that in the Hauptschule so we can keep the tract system. So it's, it's uh, like, it not just not, not just one country, but one like aspect of, of the country. They even agree on that. This, uh, this aspect is, is in existence there, but it's like built into completely opposing argumentations. Um, so my final note um, is, uh, I've never done this before. I've never ended a uh, lecture with policy advice. I want to, yeah, I'm, I'm starting a new um, well, per personal era here. <laughs> and I usually <laughs> avoid uh, giving, but this time um, I, I would like to. So my advice to you, if, if you turn into policy makers, is, is the following. If you want to promote an educational policy agenda, use a country as a projection screen that is connected to positive frames and stereotypes in your country, but that people preferably do not know anything about. So <laughs> Finland, <laughs> Finland was the perfect place. Here you see um, Pisa Pilgerfahrten, that's, that's from Spiegel Online, the biggest uh, news, um, news um, online, online news site. Finland, in the, in, the, in the forests, smart, uh, no, smart pupils grow in the forest. So here you can see these, these guys doing things with advanced computer technology and so on. Conversely, if you want to delegitimate a policy agenda, project it onto a country whose education is framed in negative stereotypes, but about which people also possess little concrete knowledge. Here you've got some pictures about <laughs> education in South Korea. Um, Schüler drill in South Korea, drill of pupils in South Korea, not, we don't learn for life, but we learn for university. Um, so nobody knows that much about <laughs> what actually happens in South Korea, so you have, you can um, use this wonderfully to, to project things. Think also about like a case that, that is pertinent to the US would be um, pupil suicides in Japan, which is still, I think, a, a, an idea that, that floats around. If you look at actual suicide rates, they're, they're, they're much, amongst adolescents, they're much higher in the US than in Japan, but still, you can still apparently, I, I haven't, uh, here I'm just sort of talking about what stuff I've read, this, I haven't um, done empirical research on this in the US, you can still see this uh, idea floating around in the media sometimes. So, if you want to project, pay less attention to what is actually happening in the country you're projecting on, but to the prior images in your country. And with this piece of policy advice, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention.